uh, hereby call this call this uh, meeting to order. Please stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Has uh, the notice of, that's, of this meeting been posted, Chancellor? I certify that the notice of the public tax rate hearing and the regular meeting has been posted in accordance with the law. All right, sir. We are now going to convene the tax rate public hearing to consider uh, our tax proposal. Uh, so I now, I now convene the tax rate public hearing. Is there any public comment? No, sir, there is no public comment for the tax hearing. Okay. Presentation of the fiscal year, I guess. Christy, do you have a presentation, ma'am? Thank you, Chair. Um, we have a few slides here, and you should also have this information in your packet. Uh, our proposed tax rate for this current year um, is at the MO rate of 0 0.0757 and an INS of 0 0.319 for a total tax rate of maintaining, as we did previously from last year, the 0 0.1076 per $100 valuation. As you can see there, we're showing the comparison from FY24 to the proposed FY25 tax rate. Um, and when you're looking at previous and historical data, you can see uh, where we're rec recommending this year to say uh, flat and maintain the same rate as last year. And that still allows us to be very competitive to our peers as well as other institutions in the state. When you're looking at the current tax rate, again, the recommendation is to maintain. This does allow us to slightly shift our mix between the maintenance and operations from 0732 to 0757. This also allows us so to make sure that the trustees are aware that we are actually going to, in this proposal, maintain our rate while also paying off an additional 31.4 million of taxpayer debt early which would save taxpayers roughly $9 million over the life of the debt. Um, in for, before you is just the legislative requirements related to the no new tax revenue, as well as our proposed tax rate, which is, allows us to stay within our voter approved tax rate uh, for this year. Also reviewing the legislative requirements, we are still within our timeline to uh, submit our tax rates, but we do need to adopt our tax rate by Monday, October 28th. And what you have before you is the tax rate adoption calendar. We did uh, receive the certified values from Harris, Montgomery, and San Jack counties on Thursday, August 29th. We held our special board meeting to vote on the proposed tax rate on September 18th. Our public hearing is, of course, this morning, as well as the proposed board meeting to adopt the tax rate immediately following. Happy to entertain any questions that the uh, trustees or anyone may have related to the recommendation. Any questions, trustees? Questions? Christy, would you please email this presentation to all of us? Could yes, you sir. do that? You sh yes, sir. You should already have that, but I'll okay. make sure y'all have all right, it. I'll, I'll check my email. Thank yes, you. sir. Anything? All right. We have announced the announcement is the date, time, and place of the of the meeting at which the board will vote on the proposed tax rate is Thursday, October the third, twenty twenty four. Uh, time ten thirty a.m. Place LSC University Park Commons Grand Hall two zero five one five Texas two forty nine Houston Texas seven seven zero seven zero. With that, I now adjourn the tax rate hearing. Thank you. I will now convene the regular meeting of the uh, Board of Trustees. Is there any public comment? Yes, sir. We have one person for public comment, Dr. Shashanka Ashiwi.
Good morning, Chair Stoma, the trustees, Chancellor Castillo. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to address this audience. And some of you might remember me. I'm Shashanka Ashili, resident of Cyprus. A disclaimer, I'm running against Chair Stoma in District 1. So with that, let me set the context of my conversation today. Let's look at the vision of LSC to lead in, I quote, to lead in creating extraordinary student experience that is transformative and unforgettable to prepare students in, to thrive in an ever evolving world. The key word is ever evolving world. And let me also say something else. A famous quote, which President Obama quoted on numerous times, the buck stops with me. And many before him and after that used that con in the context of accountability. So allow me to get into specifics. A few days back, I got an email from LSC saying that they inadvertently made a mistake of identifying district 128 as at-large districts instead of being single, single member districts. So as a new American, I was not sure what the consequence of that is. So I reached out to the community and as a scientist who spent 20 out of 24 years in the academic and research world, I looked into the research as well. So there's an awesome article by Professor Richard Murray of University of Houston and his students, which actually talks about this exact topic. And their conclusion, I quote, people of color are less likely to be elected in at-large systems because the voters of racial minorities are diluted in elections. And our district, Church Roma, is a diverse district with minorities like me. So let me be very clear. I am not blaming anyone. And I am not saying someone had a malicious intent in this. But what I want to ask is, where does the buck stop? There are many more. I will be talking about them on multiple platforms and forums, including my website at drashali.org and Facebook page. I want to get into one more. This is specifically to the trustees and all the highly paid, top 100 highly paid employees of this organization. Please go to Lone Star College website and search for Computer Networking Specialization Microsoft Program. It's an associate degree and it's computer networking. And uh, I happen to take a course in my master's on that. The occupational description of this program says, I quote, test the safety of structures, vehicles, vessels using X-ray, ultrasound, and fiber optics are related equipment, unquote. Further down, it says, make radiographic images to detect flaws. So here is my open invitation to everyone and anyone. How in the world a student will graduate with a degree in computer networks by learning non-destructive non safety quantification using X-rays and ultrasound and optics. I happen to have a PhD in optics, so I know what I'm talking. So this is not a campaign issue. It's an open invitation to anyone, please. Again, my question is, where does the buck stop? Where is the accountability? This had been there on the website for the past three months. I'd been looking into this. This was not a mistake. So with that, let me get into the second one. On December 20, 2022, the college issued a public statement saying that it was recognized as, okay, I'm running out of time, as top institutions for minorities. And the mythical number on that is 18,825 degrees compared to the same year, 2021. So the problem with that is two. One is the mythical 18,825 students, minority students, who are they and where do they exist? Because it doesn't. The second one is you are comparing 21 graduates to 21 graduates itself. So it's illogical. So, so let me get into the numbers. Page 134, sorry, I got to run. So page 134, statistical submarines, supplement of budget 23, talks about student profile. And Chair Stoma, from 2017, we started at 89,413 students to 22, 85,164. Again, where does this mythical 18,000 students came from? And I looked into that, I Googled, couldn't find anywhere other than this 18,825 as a dollar amount for tuition costs from different universities, I found that number. But in this, I did not. Is this a lie or a fancy math? Either way, Chase Toma, you signed on it. So again, I want to ask who is responsible? Where, where does the box stop? This rubber stamping and checkbox check culture under your leadership is what I'm fighting against. Whether I win or lose, this as a fellow academic person, I will put students, faculty first, 
and not congratulating yourself with fancy illu illusions. I have more I wanted to talk, but looks like I'm running out of time. So with that, I will end my conversation by quoting President Reagan words. You know, I quote, trust, but verify. And unfortunately, Chair Stoma, when I verified your leadership failed us the educators, the students, and the taxpayers, only three stakeholders for any public institute. And uh, I will be having more on this at my website. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're going to deviate from the normal agenda here. Uh, we're going to go right in considering the consent agenda. Then the board will go into closed session. We have an important issue we must uh, consider in closed session. Then we'll come back out of closed session and continue uh, with the uh, normal agenda item order. Does that make sense, folks? So I will let, let everyone know. All right. So we will now consider the consent agenda. We pulled items one and two for further discussion. Are there any other items that need to be pulled for discussion? Going once, going twice. Okay, then I need a motion to approve items three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Motion. Yes, second. All those in favor signifying by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Then those items pass, thank you. Uh, going back to item one, do I have a uh, motion to uh, discuss and approve item one? Motion. Second? Okay, I have to read something. Give me a sec. Uh, motion to adopt a property tax rate. I, Chair Stoma, move that the maintenance and operations portion of the property tax be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 0 0.0757, <clears throat> excuse me, for $100 assessed evaluation, which is effectively a 7.99% increase in the property tax. Any discussions on this? Then we will now vote. I ask you, uh, we're gonna have to do a, uh, a roll call vote on this. Sure. Yes, we, go ahead. We need a, do we need a motion and a second before we vote? We do. I think we just did. That, that was the motion and okay. the second. Okay, thank you, specific yeah. wording. So we're all gonna vote now. I'm just gonna go down the go down the row here and and uh, let you cast your vote. Trustee Pierce? Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Kane? Yes. Trustee Salivar? Yes. Trustee Murillo? Yes. Uh, Trustee Wilson? Yes. Trustee uh, Broussard? Yes. Trustee Sullivan? Yes. And I, uh, Trustee Stoma, yes. So the motion passes. Thank you. Going to go to item two. Uh, do I have a motion to consider and vote on item two? Motion. A second? Second. Right, now I must read the other one. Motion to adopt a property tax rate. I chair Stoma move that the interest and in sinking portion of the property tax rate be decreased by the adoption of a tax rate of 0 0.0313 per $100 of assessed evaluation, which is effectively a, a 2.45% decrease in the tax rate. Any discussions on this? Then we'll uh, again do a, uh, a roll call vote on this. Uh, Trustee Pierce? Yes. Trustee Kane? Yes. Trustee Salivar? Yes. Trustee Murillo? Yes. Trustee Wilson? Yes. Trustee Broussard? Yes. Trustee Sullivan? Yes. And I, Trustee Stoma, vote yes. So the item passes. Thank you. That was the big one of the big chores. I will now uh, adjourn this meeting to, so the board can go into closed session. The Board of Trustees in accordance with Section 5510001 uh, of the Texas Government Code, the Open Meetings Act, will move into closed session under one or more of the following provisions 
Section 551 071 072 074 and 076. I adjourn this meeting. We we will be back. Page two. Page two. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, just want to actually um, acknowledge that the Faculty Senate presidents, um, I think in the last week or so, uh, let the Chancellor's Office know that they will be joining us again in presenting in November. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that the board and the public was aware of that. And to the Faculty Senate presidents, um, I'm going to give you the same commitment that I've given members of the Chancellor's Cabinet. Um, you don't have to submit what you're going to present to me. I'm not going to sign off on whatever you present. We do have a deadline for when we have to get PowerPoints to make sure that they make it into the slide deck. And so um, Mike Crawl, our chief of staff, will be your point of contact for that. And so again, um, you guys are welcome to come and talk about whatever you would like subject to our policies and the law. And outside of that, um, you 100% have my support to speak about whatever you would like um, with no prior constraint from me or the administration. So thank you for agreeing to do that. And that's good news. I'm glad you made that decision. Uh, uh, and that's all I have on that front, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor's Cabinet. Matthew, you're up, sir. Actually, sir, I think you're Oh, let us do one thing. My oversight. We're going to need to approve the minutes of our September fifth meeting. So give me, give us just a, a minute. Um, I need a motion to for approval of the minutes of the September fifth, twenty twenty four regular meeting, and the September eighteenth, twenty twenty four special meeting. Do I have a motion? Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No one passes. All right, sir, you're up. Chair, members of the board, Chancellor Castillo, thank you for allowing me to be here today to give me the opportunity to present the I Want to Be A initiative. The U.S. Army had an ad campaign and a marketing effort to show young people how they can achieve their goals and become the best version of themselves. The Be All You Can Be campaign, so successful that in 2023, they brought it back. Nike's Just Do It ad campaign has been inspiring athletes for over 20 years. This marketing campaign, so impactful, that it's transcended beyond shoes and t-shirts to becoming a mantra and words to live by. Is there a higher educational equivalent to these successful marketing campaigns? Well, there is such a campaign here at Lone Star College System. I Want to Be an Initiative creates a space where any employee can strive to be all they can be while providing a platform so they can just do it. This I Want to Be A started from an email update from our chancellor in which he writes, this idea is coming from the lawyer who wanted to be a chancellor. This initiative is about helping our employers. Chancellor Castillo wrote in his address to the employees, we are an institution of higher education that upskills our community and our employees. Pathways should exist not just for students, but for people that teach them and support them as well. This also aligns well with our Aspen Institute, a designation that we are aspiring to achieve, which calls upon colleges and universities to be developers of talent and drivers of economic mobility. We have always wanted better lives for our students, but we must also find and nurture the talent that lies within this organization. Chancellor Castillo further wrote that he is committed to opening pathways to all employees. This included everyone at all levels of this institution. In this commitment, he set up an email address, one that he personally answered to find out who in our institution was daydreaming of a better opportunity. 
to find out who in our institution wanted to contribute differently to our overall mission, to find out if there were any people who had been passed over for promotions. Some told him it would never work. Others said nobody would answer. In reality, there were many responses, approximately 125 responses to the call out. Responders came from all levels of our institution. There were even responses for positions that didn't yet exist. There was even a submission for an employee about a colleague who was deserving an opportunity. The result of this initiative is over 40 individuals, myself included, who are now doing something different to contribute to the overall mission of the, this college. 40 plus individuals who have filled a niche to help our system achieve its mission. 40 plus individuals who are fulfilling an aspirational employment goal. What is transformative for a system of our size is this collected data also serves as an actionable pool where we can look to find employees to serve when needs arise. Student workers benefit too. For an example, we had a part-time student worker who was working towards an analytics data degree. That student worker was able to be able to move from a web coordinator to an actual position in data analytics. Another example was a creative, a creative services specialist was actually moved to a media manager to better navigate some of the emerging technologies. Why are we doing this? Why would the board or the community care? Because it speaks to an organization that prioritizes organizational efficiency. Developing talent and leadership as well as an organization that has the foresight to consider succession. It speaks to an organization that fosters employee engagement and hears aspirations of its employees. And lasting culture gets formed. And that cultural impact is a val value of loyalty and enhances employee retention. I want to work at Lone Star because Lone Star sees my potential and Lone Star helps me get there. And while it's been in all levels of the institution, there have been a few cohort-based uh, programs, especially for those aspiring for higher leadership. For example, I want to be a college president. That was launched under the leadership of Dr. Leanne Nutt from Tomball. And this cohort has had presentations from all of the senior the sitting presidents, as well as members from chancellor's cabinet. Topics have include all things on how to become a college president and all things on how to be a college president. We have reviewed board policy, resume writing, presidential interviews forums, shared governance, the history of the Lone Star College system, and higher ed finance. There have even been opportunities to shadow and mentor. The I Want to Be a Vice President of Instruction started this last summer, and I've had the pleasure of running this cohort. Working with the aspirational vice presidents of instruction, we've conducted two-way interviews where we get to interview the candidates, and then they get to interview the sitting VPIs. We've also had my favorite session, which was where the VPIs get to share some of the I can't believe this just happened moments so that the candidates really can learn from our experiences. And lastly, and most importantly, we talk about developing the skill set as they transition from going from dean to vice president of instruction. Our largest cohort is the I want to be a dean. And those are those employees that are aspiring to be division or academic or student services deans. It just kicked off last week and led by our system organizational development team. The cohort has 30 people attending these sessions. They have been talking about relationship building, mentoring, networking, all of the roles of the dean. That should continue throughout this year. Other program benefits. This aligns with Talent Strong Texas. It aligns with our great places to work. It aligns with the chancellor's goals as it increases employee satisfaction, morale, and the quality of our workforce. 
It gives agency and voice to those passed over employees, some of whom have never been asked before if they wanted to be anything other. It builds a very robust talent pool and one that we can call upon in an emergency. Another ancillary benefit is its leaders leading leaders. Just the action of being able to coach and just the action of being able to reach back and teach is a valuable resource, not only for the ones attending the session, but for the ones leading them. Lastly, and really most importantly, how is this good for students? In a very public way, it shows that being here at Lone Star College, all things are possible. That being part of Lone Star as a student and now as an employee, we are committed to improving the lives and offering a better future. And ultimately, isn't that what we're trying to show our students? I do want to thank everyone for taking part in this program. It went in under a year from an idea to an action to an application. I want to be a version 2.0 is launching. And I can tell you that there's a general excitement around the participation in 2.0 because this is real and this is working. My final message to all of the current cohorts to the future cohorts, I hope that you get a chance to be all that you can be. And if you get an opportunity, just do it. Thank you for allowing me to present, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Can you send me a link to this? <laughs> <laughs> I need to figure out what I want to be. <laughs> any other comments, questions, trustees? Thank you, sir. Good job you're doing. Thank you. The AFT. Comments? Good morning. I am not Dr. John Berka. He wishes he was here, but he had to uh, go teach a class, but he will return uh, next month. Today's meeting of the Board of Trustees will be the last time we will meet together in this forum before election day on Tuesday, November 5th. Three members of this board are finishing their current six year terms as trustees. One of the three is unopposed for a second term and the other two are running free election. So you may very well all be back. Nevertheless, we in the FT do not want to let this opportunity pass by without thanking you for your service the responsibility all three of you, as well as the other members of the board, took on to oversee a college system of this size, the complexity is immense. You have each attended 60 public board meetings, around 12 board retreats, six galas, plus numerous committee meetings, a long list of college events and ceremonies, and more late night phone calls than I can imagine. You have had to help navigate the college through more weather-related disasters than we could have ever foreseen, plus the most severe public health crisis in over 100 years. In addition, you were responsible for the most solemn responsibility your duties require of you, the selection of a new chancellor. And for all of this, we never pay you a dime. So at this point, AFT Lone Star is pleased to publicly recognize the following trustees for their contributions to our college over the last six years. Michael Stoneman representing District 1, Ernestine Pierce representing District 2, and Mike Sullivan representing District 8. We thank you for your service. Thank you. We also thank the other six members of the board whose terms are ongoing. As the election approaches, we want to share with you something that the AFT is doing to further Democrat, to further the democratic process in the Lone Star community. Especially with the huge media attention that is going to the big national and state races, it is hard for candidates for down ballot races to get their stories before the public. As you know, the AFT publishes a periodic newsletter called The Advocate which is sent to, out to all 7,000 Lone Star employees. Because we distribute the newsletter electronically through college email, which classifies as public property, we cannot and will not use the advocate to tell Yellis employees 
to tell LSE employees who they should or should not vote for. However, we are offering our pages to all candidates running in the two contested districts to introduce themselves, highlight their qualifications, and share their vision for Lone Star College. This gives all candidates an equal opportunity to make their case to Lone Star employees and through them to their friends, family, and neighbors in the community. Think of this like a League of Women Voters Guide, especially for the Board of Trustees election. I am pleased to say that all candidates in both open races have accepted our offer and have submitted statements that we will publish unedited and unredacted in our next issue of The Advocate, which will come out before early voting begins. In District 1, in addition to Mr. Stoma, the other candidates who will be included are Mr. Paul Santilland and Dr. Ashili Shashanka. I think that's really Dr. Shashanka Ashili. <laughs> Excuse us. In District 2, in addition to Ms. Pierce, the other candidate who will be included is Mr. Daniel Mesa. Running for public office is hard work and puts a candidate under intense scrutiny. So we wish to thank all of these candidates for having the courage to put themselves forward. We hope that our efforts will assist all of our employees in the greater community to decide who they believe are the best folks to lead Lone Star College into the next six years. I want to finish up this morning with a matter of personal privilege. With the new board meeting time, John will need to leave University Park between 11.30 and 11.45 to get to Westway Park Technology Center to teach a class, which is where he went today. Please accept his apologies in advance if he has to walk out before this meeting or any meeting concludes. As important as the board meeting is, teaching our students is his highest priority. Now, last summer, no one on the board took him up on his offer to take his college algebra class. And I am sure that you all regret that this morning. This could be your lucky day, though. If you finish your deliberations early enough, you can go and audit his class at Westway. Today, he will be teaching about composition of functions, and I am sure you do not want to miss that. He thanks you for your kind attention and wishes everyone a great day. Thank you. Uh, board members, any uh, comments or anyone? Committee, go ahead. Okay. A, a recent uh, item in the uh, LSE Newswatch really caught my attention because it dealt with artificial intelligence. Of course, we all know um, all of the issues involved with artificial intelligence, what the future may bring, and and so on and so forth. I was delighted to see that at University Park here, there is a new artificial intelligence associate's degree and a lab here at University Park that have been launched. And um, all of the implications that come with that for students who are in that associate's degree program in terms of the potential for um, hands-on work, practical experience, theoretical knowledge, and so on and so forth. And I want to read this quote from uh, Steve Kayla. He said that the inauguration of the AI lab and degree program will provide hands-on experiences to prepare our students to lead and excel, lead and excel. And I think that's so commendable. So I want to thank Mr. Kayla, Dr. Dempsey, and many other people for the launch of that program, because I think that is going to open a lot of doors for a lot of our students. So thank you for that. Any other comments? Trustee Sullivan? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, speaking to my colleagues for a minute, I, from time to time, have questions in between meetings, and I send the chancellor an email I, he's responsive, and, and I cleared this with him in advance, just so you know. He's responsive, but he he puts so much effort into the answers that questions generate answers like this. And he collected a lot of questions that I had asked over several days, and I told him that I had to stop and take a break while I was reading his answers. 
And then I stopped and I thought to myself, what have I done? I'm serious because I, my simple questions, which are really important to me and they've got to be answered fast, take an extraordinary amount of his time. And I said, if you don't mind, I, I really apologize for asking these questions. Some of them are important. Most of them are not. And I said, I think we need to remind ourselves and, and I'm not preaching. I'm just sharing my personal perspective. I said, I think we need to remind ourselves that we're trustees and we might have questions, but our chancellor is so thorough and so professional that he, it's a, it could be a distraction. So I, I asked his permission if I could bring it up. And he said, sure. Uh, it, it, I'm glad he didn't say no, but all kidding aside, I, it's just a reminder that the work that we create for him is a distraction in from what he's trying to do in running this institution. And for me, I'm more mindful now of what I ask of him and when I ask it of him. And Chancellor, if, if you'd like to add anything to that, feel free, but I'm just being um, as helpful as I can as a trustee to you and respect for the institution by, by saying what I did. No, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, part of it is we do want to be really responsive. We want to be really transparent um, about answering your questions as thoroughly as we can. And one of the things that's really important to me is if I don't understand the question, then I'm going to give you all the answer instead of sort of um, withhold, right? So I'll say, if you meant this, here's the answer, which is part of what you're talking about. Um, if you meant this, then here's the answer. If you meant this other thing, here's the answer. And then here are all the attachments, right? And I'll tell you, you see a lot of the employees and staff in the audience laughing because I send uh, monthly updates to the entire system and they're just as long. And so I literally start them with, if you're reading the first sentence of this, go ahead and get comfortable, get a cup of coffee because we're going to be here for a little bit. And so they know that. And so again, one of the things that's really important to me is being transparent. And I never want to be accused of withholding information from the board or employees. And sometimes I, I do get carried away and I overdo it, but I hope that I'm given some grace and that I'm, I'm trying to be transparent and forthcoming with responding to information as, as clearly as I can. But thank you, trustee. Any other comments? Trustee Salvador? Thank you, Chairman. I do have a comment. I just want to thank the um, chancellor and and his staff for bringing the Pulitzer Prize author um, to honor Hispanic Heritage Month. I had uh, three colleagues attending that event. Um, Trustee Wilson, uh, I'm sorry, Trustee Pierce, Trustee Sullivan, and uh, Trustee Kane, who were with me um, at the event. I just I knew about that author because the book that she wrote was immensely um, poetic, but it was extremely good. And I know that the chancellor bought a couple of books and sort of um, gave some away to those who attended the meeting. But um, I really appreciate him bringing the author. I think it brought us a new definition, at least to those who were there or read the book, a new definition of what, um, you know, a sisterly love is, but also how she wrote the book, which was extremely poetic. So if you haven't read it, I really wish that you do. Um, it's Liliana's journey. And so I just want to thank everybody and, and obviously the chancellor for bringing her because I asked him um, a couple of weeks ahead of time and he said, I'll do it for you. And you did. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And just so everyone knows, if you're sitting there like, man, I missed it, we're actually bringing her, we're working through it right now to bring her back for an encore presentation. Um, so we're actually going to do it again. And this time we're going to have it here at UP um, because I think it's really important. Um, if you read the book and you're familiar with the story, it has to do with dating violence and and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I don't want to ruin the book for you. So that's all I'll say. And I think it's really important um, for our young people um, on the colleges to hear that story and hear sort of how some of the consequences are. If you know that someone is being abused and you, and you don't say anything or you think that it's not your problem or any of your business, um, there can be some life altering consequences to that silence. And so we are going to bring her back. Um, we're going to try to bring her here uh, to UP so that students can come because at the last event we had it at system office, the Woodlands, um, 
And I really sort of want to thank it's Danielle Miller and her staff that work for Vice Chancellor uh, Melson that really sort of have been the laboring oars of, of getting that done. And we're going to buy, we bought a hundred books and she was gracious enough to autograph them. And we're going to buy another hundred and bring her back so that students can experience that as well. So um, thank you, ma'am. Good. Yes, ma'am. And you guys will be invited if you want round two. Okay. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Mr. Chair, can I say something? Absolutely. Okay. Trustee Pierce. And I wanted to say this and El Chancellor kind of stole my thunder a little bit. Well, the author did bring to, to me, which I'm an advocate of, we need to, as a college, I don't know where this starts, I guess, with our counseling and CIS, we need to really start advocating this dating violence. This stuff really goes on, and she brought it to a head in her book, as well as domestic violence. Now, I don't know how we're going to do it, but sometimes we need to prepare these young women. They don't even know they're in a dating violence situation. Believe me, they don't. They think it's love. And that ought to be on this campus. There should be, I don't know who I need to get in touch with, but I guess I'll find somebody, but I would like to see at least uh, what do I want to call it? kind of a training or, you know, set up some workshops where uh, some of our, I'm not going to say the non-traditional students, but our, our traditional students who are young, just coming out of high school, that they attend some of these. I don't know if we can put it, what is, what is that? Education 1300. Don't we have a course that's called Education 1300? Yes, ma'am. Maybe that could be a component where that, as they come in, that is brought into it because domestic violence is real. Even now, judges have to have CLA, which is training in domestic violence every year. That's how major this is. And dated violence is a precursor to that. So that's what I loved about what Dr. Garza did. She brought that to the forefront and she was saying, let's not make this a taboo where we don't talk about these things. You know, it's kind of a cultural thing in different cultures. You just don't say anything about certain things. But we need to break that and we just start talking. And, you know, I don't have a problem with that. So. That is one thing I loved about her book. And I think that because uh, El Chancellor said he's bringing her back to UP, that some of the faculty, you can bring some of your students into, they really need to hear her. She's really good. And I think she she kind of will have them open up about, you know, maybe some of the things that are bottled in, maybe they'll say something or ask questions, but I really enjoyed it. And I think maybe she ought to go to every campus, but I'm pushing it. I know, okay, I'll stop here. All right, thank you. Any others, Maria? So, uh, welcome to the 10.30 a.m. meeting. First, uh, I think um, this morning I, I had a uh, meeting at Cypher Chamber of Commerce, uh, Transportation and Government Affairs Committee. It's part of my role at Metro and Public Affairs role. I, you know, I attend, like a lot of you do, sometimes I see you at some of these uh, community meetings. So, it actually worked out for me pretty well because it's not very far, right, I, I, uh, from, from here. Uh, but anyway, what I wanted to share with you is I, um, after I gave my comment report, I also mentioned uh, about our meeting today, right? And announced that from now on, we're going to be meeting at 1030 a.m. on the you know, first uh, Thursday of the month. And uh, the the, re the response was very positive, uh, uh, enthusiastic response. I mentioned uh, among the reasons we wanted to change it is to give the public or community that like them a chance to kind of come out, you know, and I know that. Um, everybody has busy schedules. Uh, everybody has to schedule time to, to attend meetings. Uh, but I, I was pleased at the enthusiasm, especially Leslie, who's the president. Her and I did the Leadership North Houston many years ago, number 13. That was a while back. Uh, so we remain we stay in touch. So she was glad to, to hear that. And also, you know, someone mentioned I, I'm looking, I've been wanting to meet the president, uh, your new chancellor. I said, well, that's one place you can come meet them and meet some of our le other leaders as well. So anyway, I just mentioned that so that I encourage also to I encourage you guys, everyone to like, you know, tell folks about our meetings this morning. You know, uh, this is when you can catch all any of us here, um, get a chance to, 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 to meet wonderful people that work, work for Lone Star College. And I think over time, I think, uh, you, you know, the way the nature of these meetings, I think it, people put it on their calendar, right? People kind of know when it takes place. And and I know um, not everybody can make it every time, but but if they can come out to to one of these meetings, uh, I think uh, the, uh, it's good for them because they 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 get to learn about what we do, they get to meet the people, um, and and then for us as as, as trustees, uh, it's great to to get a chance to kind of come come together and uh, and and get a chance to to meet up with our our, our constituents, right? And and play, especially at a place like this, so. 
anyway, I just wanted to mention that. I think it's enthusiastic reception and I look forward to many more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any uh, committee reports? No reports from the committees? All right, then I guess financial report. Christy, you're up again. Yes, thank you, Chair, Trustees, Chancellor. I know you did escape the auditing of the algebraic class, but not the auditing of the finance class. So I will keep my report brief and to the point for you. So what you have in your packet is looking at uh, the financial statements with a month end of August 31st. Um, it is important to note that while this is through August 31st, we have not officially closed out the FY24. We continue to close out um, through approximately November 8th is our goal. Um, so these numbers are still subject to change, but this is as official closeout of the 31st. So what you are looking at here is the continuation of the trend that we have continued to receive additional revenue beyond what we had budgeted. Um, 21 million to be exact, more than that was budgeted in FY24, resulting in the 104.7% revenue that you see as compared to previous years and as we've tracked throughout the year. That's been a consistent flow. Uh, we've mentioned that was due to state appropriations, uh, tuition and fees, tax revenues. Um, the net total change in revenue, though, since you've seen this last month, was an additional 169225 So looking at expenditures, uh, we did uh, trend significantly down over expenditures at the same reporting period last year, um, shoring up that we've uh, spent as of the 31st 90.7% of the budget. Again, we're not officially closed and they're still posting things to the FY24 budget, but we do anticipate that there will be remaining budget authority um, that will need to be presented to the trustees for determination if that goes into reserves or is uh, moved over for capital projects. So I'll pl plan to bring discussion to the trustees next month with more information on that. So looking at the financial statements in this method, it really just breaks it down um, based off of category. Uh, Chair Stoneman, this is one of the items that you had requested a couple months back. It's just a little detailed visual of those specific categories. And as you can see here, uh, we're tracking uh, above in each of those categories, again, resulting in the excess revenue that we did receive. So always a good problem to have more revenue than what you budgeted, oh, yeah. uh, but we try to get that as best as possible so that we can actually spend it in the budget year that we've received it. So when we're looking at the variances noted, uh, these are actual changes from budget to actual. So again, every time you're seeing this, it is based off of what was budgeted versus what we actually received. And so again, I think highlight here on the expenditure side, um, this is a question that comes up often. Uh, when you're looking at salaries year in through the 31st, 60% of our budget was salary through August 31st, 9% benefits. So roughly that is about 75% of our expenditures are personnel for the FY24. Um, these numbers do not include vacation accruals, so that may continue to flush out. But when you're looking at it, you can see that about 75% of our overall budget is related to um, the hard cost related to personnel. Mm. And then again, this is just a financial statement looking at the month end with the variances. Um, we do have some capital projects that will continue to hit the budget and we will bring those forth next month for you to see. Uh, one of the items that had been requested previously was a slide that also, also denoted our cash reserves. Um, so what you see here is what was budgeted for cash reserves in FY24 what the FY24 with the set aside would be, and that what we anticipate the FY25 budget reserves to look like, and that's $169 million. So it's important to note that the cash reserve figure that you see does not include the estimated $40 million of the ERP set aside. So that is an important variable that I wanna make sure that all the trustees are aware, are aware of. And the delineation between the forecasted set aside and the after is because as I've reported to you all, we previously were able to put 36 million of that commitment into the um, set aside account. We still owed approximately 4 million to put in that account. And so that is what that is calculating so that we still owe that 4 million to the, the set aside which would net us a cash reserve of 169 uh, leading into the FY25 budget. 
You also have a copy of your buildings and grounds report in your packet, and I'm happy to entertain any questions um, that the uh, trustees may have. Chair, can I be recognized? Absolutely. Thank you. So Dr. Vianne, um, will you go back to slide 30? Yes. So I, I want to, Dr. Vianne kind of foreshadowed a conversation for November, and I wanted to go ahead and give the public uh, notice and the board of sort of kind of where I'm thinking as a chancellor. So I want to talk about real quickly the interaction between, I think it's slide 25. So if you go back to 25 for me. So on slide 25, um, Yes. So if you see there, uh, 22 to 23, we spent 99.8% essentially of the budget right now. And, and disclaimer noted, we haven't closed until November 8th. Approximately. Yes. All right. So around November 8th, we're going to close. And if these projections hold, then we really have about 9% of the budget um, that we have not spent. And so this goes back to something that I've talked about at convocation and talked at other items at other events about how we are doing increasingly more and more um, and spent more and more academically food pantries for our students, but we're actually spending um, less money. And so what that's allowed us to do is now we have that delta of about eight or 9%. So it raises the question, what do we do with it? And traditionally we have just um, either have already spent it or it's become, for example, this year, we had to pay 4 million into um, a promise um, to move 40 million when we actually only had 36 at the time. So we went ahead and made that $44 uh, million commitment. And even with that, um, we still have sort of this delta. And so Dr. Bien, one of the points that she made earlier and she and I are discussing is I think the recommendation from my office is going to be to continue to maintain the reserve um, at the status quo, which means a percentage of that money is going to go into reserves. Um, and really, I think what, when the board thinks about it, it's more of the fund balance, right? And the difference of this year is instead of just kind of pro formally rolling it all into the fund balance, uh, my recommendation is going to be that we do just enough to keep that percentage as a percentage of the growing budget the same, but then the remaining balance be set aside in capital improvement projects for both North Harris and the Tomball campus that are well overdue for renovations. And that is going to be my recommendation in November. And I just wanted to give you all a heads up, the public members of the media, um, that that is where I'm at. So if you have an opinion about that, that you can be prepared in November to discuss it. And I welcome any questions from the board on that front. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm not for the chancellor, if I may. Could I pivot to Dr. Vien? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, would you go back to slide 26 and looking at the investment income, 9 million versus 17 million, do you have any thoughts on the potential impact going forward of falling interest rates or do we need to be thinking about how our investments are currently allocated. Yes, um, definitely. That is a conversation that our treasury department and I have frequently and something we're very much mindful of. Um, we have been going through quite a bit of exercises with our treasury team to make sure that we have um, really good cash flow um, projections and that we really understand what our obligations are. Um, and we do have, um, per the investment, we have a quite a bit of things that are going to be coming due. And so we are having those conversations ongoing because, yes, we do need to start moving some of our investment into um, laddered maturities. We want to be intentional about that. Um, and so we know that we can't continue to earn at the the fixed rate that we've seen, um, but we want to do that strategically and want to make sure that we're doing it with the most uh, relevant and updated information. So that's been the last four or five months the Treasury team has been working on our updates to our cash flow, our projections, making sure that every time we commit funds to a capital project that we have cash reserves and cash access to be able to back those things up. So uh, we're digging into that on a daily basis. And so, yes, that's something we actually hope to have a couple meetings internally in the next couple weeks weeks to start moving some things um, into a more diversified portfolio. So good. Thank you. Great work. Thanks. Yes, sir. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, future agenda items. Any future agenda, agenda items, folks? 
So, Chair, before you adjourn, I did neglect to do two things that I wanted to do, if you'll indulge Get me. Right here. All right. So, first of all, I wanted to um, let the board know that we have an interim president of LSE Online, which is Dr. Bent Court, who's right. You have to stand up. <laughs> He's right there. Um, and if you're wondering, Dr. Kishvala is still here. She's right over there. And so um, one of the reorganizations that I have uh, carried out is I believe that um, a lot of future instruction is online based. And I think the board agrees. So we need to have someone whose sole dedication at Lone Star College is running LSC online. So that's Dr. Ben Court, who's been um, Dr. Keshvala's deputy at LSC online. So it's a natural progression uh, for the interim position. As soon as we finish the search for the UP president, uh, which I believe last I heard we were down to 12, board. Um, we're down to the 12, I guess, quarter finalists. Yes. Yes, or octa finalists, actually, um, I think. So once we finish that search, which we're hoping to have a new president of uh, LSEUP by January, then we're going to start the search process, interviews and all of that for the LSC online president, um, because under board policy, a strict reading of board policy says that all presidents must be searched. And so we're going to make sure that LSE online is also sort of treated like every other campus. Um, so that was one. And then I, too, I did want to take a, a minute to thank um, Chris Williams, our CIO. Chris, I think you're back there. Um, and uh, go ahead. You have to stand up, too. And thank you. And OTS, because this month, at least from my perspective, has been much better than the last boarding meeting that we had for the audio and visual. So thank you guys all for your work. And that's all I have, Chair. Thank you. All right. Any future agenda items? All right. It's uh, what? 1239. I adjourn this meeting. <laughs>